Hello and welcome to our show. I'm Jigur and today we have a special guest with us, David Fallon, who works as a network operations training at APNIC. Yep. And also David is an expert in solutions architecture and networking and he's currently in Mongolia for a week long visit to educate Mongolian engineers. Honored to have him with today and let's give a warm welcome to David Fallon. Thank you very much. Yeah, we'll talk about also computer networks in Mongolia, such as how we connect to the internet and etc. Let's start from the beginning. So how's Mongolia? How many times is this to visit to here? So this is my second trip to Mongolia. I was last here in October last year for the uh, Mongolia Network Operators Group fourth uh, conference. So I conducted some workshops with uh, some of my teammates as well as some of our local instructors that we have here in Mongolia and that was that was my first trip and that was fantastic so this time around it's a little bit colder <laughs> so yeah but it's been a good trip so far when was the recent trip to here the previous visit October October so October last year oh yeah, yeah. tell us briefly about your career so I've been working as a network and systems engineer now for probably close to 25 years maybe a bit longer uh, so that should tell you how old I actually am. <laughs> but I've worked in every section of, of IT from networking systems, uh, infrastructure, infrastructure uh, storage, data centers. I've had my hands on everything. So it's been, a, it's been an interesting career because you, I, I think to be a good IT professional, you need to be fairly well-rounded. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of professionals I've talked to today are still very single career focus, single thread focus, and having an understand, understanding of the, the whole ecosystem, I think makes you a better, a better engineer. Yeah, yeah. What does APNIC do? So APNIC is the uh, regional internet registry for uh, the Asia Pacific region. Mm -hmm. So we cover from India, Pakistan, in South Asia, all the way across to some of the Pacific Islands, right on the international dateline. Uh, so there's 56 economies and as the regional internet registry we're responsible for the internet numbering within this region. We also have some additional responsibilities so making sure things like reverse DNS works properly and part of my job is actually internet development so assisting economies with uh, infrastructure development, people development and critical infrastructure, so things like in, uh, internet exchange points and root DNS servers, which is the glue that holds the internet together. So, mm -hmm. so is it under the control ICANN or not? IANA. So IANA is... IANA. The, yeah. So ICANN's the names, IANA's the numbers. So uh, there's five regional internet registries around the world. So we look after Asia Pacific, AFRINIC looks after Africa, RIPE is Europe, Aaron is North America and Lacknick is South America. South America. Oh, there's a so, total of five. Total of five. And, and we've all got our chunks of the world to look you after. You mentioned that there are 56 economies, means 56 countries. Countries, correct. Countries. Ah, okay. Yeah. Okay, so let's have a very simple conversation without talking about technical stuff <laughs> as much as possible. Mm -hmm. And current state of the internet infrastructure in Mongolia and how does the inter internet work in Mongolia? For example, where do we get the internet, is there any way that we can use the internet faster than now? So the fastest form of internet available to most users is usually fixed broadband. So whether that be delivered from a um, what we call a gigabit PON network, so a, a fibre connected network, mm -hmm. uh, or whether it be through some other physical connected means, gives you the lowest latency so your packets travel a bit quicker and gives you the potential of more bandwidth. So there's a couple of providers within Mongolia that do those sorts of products. Next one up from that, or second best from that, would be a, a wireless type product, so a fixed point-to-point -point wireless. So usually in those instances, a wireless internet service provider will put up an antenna somewhere and they will service multiple buildings or multiple residences from that one point. So that's a point to multi-point radio. The most common internet access method in Mongolia is actually these. Mobile, Mobile phones. phones. About 80% of the population currently use a mobile device as their primary. Uh, 80. 80. Oh. So there's only around 300,000 fixed broadband connections to homes in Mongolia. 
whereas you've got 1.6 million or more internet users. So they're using these. Yeah, yeah. So it's it's a little bit different to obviously where I come from. Uh, we're probably a lot the other way, where more 70% is fixed and the 30% is primary mobile, mm -hmm. but we all have a secondary device. So I have my primary internet at home and I've got my mobile device as well. Yes. So we're always connected. But as to how we connect from Mongolia out to the rest of the world, you're, you're not unique in the fact that you're landlocked. Yes. Because, uh, again, being from Australia, we've got ocean all around us, so we have submarine cables that travel under the ocean and connect to some of the major internet points within the world, or around the Pacific and the Indian Ocean. Uh, from here, you've only got two options. You either go through China over to Hong Kong, Hong Kong. or you go through Russia into Berlin. Frankfurt. Uh, Frankfurt, yeah. yeah. So they're your two primary termination points. Um, and the problem is, they're not the cheapest ways of getting around, but you don't really have much choice at this stage. Yeah, yeah. So about the pricing, the internet cost is, is compared to the other countries, consider it cheapest, one oh, of absolutely. the cheapest. Yes. yes. Why is that? I'm not How really sure. Um, I've tried to look at where the, the savings are within uh, Mongolia. Some of it could be in the hardware choices. Um, a lot of the vendors that are in use in Mongolia, uh, we actually aren't allowed to use in Australia for national security reasons. Uh -huh. So, and there is a, a significant price difference between their hardware and some of the other vendors' hardware. Um, also, could be comparative wage costs as well. Right. So, well, com comparative like salary costs. Oh, yeah. So, okay. cost of living wage here is generally lower than what we have, um, which means you don't have that same sort of wage expense. Uh -huh. So there's probably some savings there as well. But you also seem to be clustered in like population here, population here, population here, whereas we're a lot more spread out. So our internet service providers have to cover a very large land mass mm -hmm. and that adds to the cost for us. So. Um, we also have a significantly larger population. Yes. But most of our population, or 97% of our population, lives around the edge. <laughs> Not many the, people uh, live in the middle. The coastline. Yep, yes. we all live on the coast, or yeah. within 100 kilometers of the coast. Yeah. So you, that's a lot of area that you've got to try and keep connected. Uh, so yeah. there's a lot more expense, I think, for us to maintain yeah. networks. CapEx. Big CapEx. The next question is, that what, are, what are the challenges and limitations associated with our internet usage in the near future? Could be. So some of the challenges are going to be um, shortage of IPv4 addressing. Mongolia, relatively speaking, has been late to the internet market. So the way IPv... So one of the biggest problems we have on the internet in general is IPv4 address shortage. Uh, a lot of the other RIRs have run out of address space already and anything that they're issuing at the moment is recycled. So people who have handed back their addresses because they're not using them or have sold them. Um, so for a new person wanting to start an internet service provider in Mongolia, with only a very limited pool of IPv4, means you've got a very limited number of customers you can actually even look at servicing from day one. So there is an alternative, is to try and deploy more IPv6, which is why I've been here all week. Um, that gives you a lot more growth potential. And the way the internet is currently changing, we're starting to see a tipping point between where IPv4 is the dominant address family yes. versus IPv6. So in the United States, which I, I tend to use as a benchmark as a developed economy, but for the first time, they actually went 52% as a country mm -hmm. IPv6, yeah. which tells me that there's a lot more service providers now deploying IPv6 as their primary internet. Yeah. So it's getting there. About the transition to the IPv6, 
what is the most difficult challenges for ISP companies and big enterprises yep. and also the retail users like us? So retail users shouldn't really feel much pain at all. Mm -hmm. um, if you're running a modern, you know, in the last two to three year old uh, CPE, uh, router at home, uh, it should be seamless. You shouldn't feel any difference at all. Mm -hmm. Mobile users, again, it's usually a carrier pushed update to your phone and it will work. Business is a bit different. Enterprises have a lot more to consider than a home user. Mm -hmm. They run services, they possibly have sensitive data that they need to make sure is kept protected. So they've got a little bit more to do in their due diligence before they deploy. But there is an unreasonable fear in some of the sector that, that they think that they're less secure because we've got a globally available address. Mm -hmm. um, it's more about explaining to those enterprise network administrators and server administrators that IPv6 is nothing to be scared of. It's just another address. Yes. You still firewall it the same as you normally do, but they've all been living with network address translation for so long yeah. that they've got this false sense of security that their network address translation is protecting them. Mm. But the reality is most of your vulnerabilities come from within not from outside coming in. Yeah. Malware, viruses, it doesn't matter whether it's IPv4 or IPv6, that's in you know, an upper layer above the IP layer. Yeah. So it doesn't care. You can see that. So about the future of the internet developing in Mongolia, so what kind of support do you think is needed to achieve this? So at the moment, Mongolia is actually, from an IPv6 standpoint, is really well placed to actually go from almost you know zero percent which we which mongolia was in october last year to 40 percent ipv6 adoption by the end of the year uh -huh. we've had discussions over the last few days with some of the uh, mobile operators and the fixed broadband operators and they're poised they're ready to strike um, it's going to be a bit different here to what we've seen in other economies though. So normally, so if I look at India, yes, they've got a billion people, but they had one mobile network operator deploy IPv6. And they went, Who's that? that was Reliance Geo. So they deployed IPv6 and they went from 50th in the world to 23rd to now number one in the world as a country and as an operator for IPv6 deployment. Oh. So India is at 79 or 80 percent deployment. Reliance Geo is 97 percent IPv6 preferred. So 97 percent of their traffic is on IPv6. Oh, that, that's that's huge. It is absolutely huge. So if I look at comparable economy sizes, I look at Myanmar. So Myanmar. Myanmar. If, yeah. If I go back two years ago, we're not in the top 20 lists at all. But as at December, they're 58 percent IPv6. So it can be yeah. done over a short period of time. Um, I think the mobile operators are probably going to wait until they do their 5G deployments. It, for them, it probably doesn't make sense to do IPv6 on 4G. They've probably got some significant investment they would have to make in terms of vendor licensing to make that happen. So I think they're probably going to wait for 5G. So Mongolia is going to be the reverse of what we see in other economies. Uh -huh. In other economies, it's the mobile networks that drive IPv6 uptake. I think here, it's going to be the fixed and the wireless providers that are going to push that number up. Okay, so you mentioned about Myanmar. Economy is not so different than us, I think. Well, they're, uh, they're, they're a little bit better in that They've got some submarine cable that comes oh, yeah, in, yeah. so they're not landlocked. And also, uh, but they've the had population. Some, population's about the same. Yeah. They've had some obvious political problems over the last couple of years, but even throughout that, they've still managed to keep things running and actually improve their networks. So they've worked hard for that. So that, that leads to the next question. Can you share with us some of the success stories or notable achievements you've been seeing as a result to train to the Mongolian engineers? So, one thing I've always said, like, one of my friends has, has been to Mongolia a couple of times and he did this role before I did, I did this role. And he said he was always impressed with the aptitude and the technical capability of Mongolian engineers. 
I've tend to, this is now my second trip, and in my first trip, I was teaching a different course. It was network monitoring and management. Over half my class had never used Linux before. Mm -hmm. By the end of five days, it was like they'd been using it their entire lives. Mongolian engineers learn to adapt very, very quickly. You have fantastic you know, mathematical and logical ability to work through something mm -hmm. that I hadn't seen anywhere else. It's quite amazing. So, but yeah. Good to hear that. Yes. Yeah. And also, so from your perspective of view, so how, how many years uh, will we take to to fully transit to transition to the IP v6? So how many years is it going to take? I don't totally. know. Totally. I don't know. <laughs> uh, look, it's 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 a, it's one of those questions. How long is a piece of string? You know, it's half as long as, as it is from the middle. It's everyone's going to change, develop at a different rate. Um, I mean, in Australia, we have terrible IPv6 adoption. We're at 38%. We have been for a while now. It is slowly going up, but it's going to depend on you know, different market forces and different problems in each different economy. There will be one day in the future where you know, some of the core operators in the internet go, well, I've only got 2% IPv4 traffic. Why am I still supporting this? And they turn it off. Yeah, and then after that, then after that, we're pure V6. Um, how long is that going to take? I don't know. It'll just be one day everybody says, this isn't worth supporting anymore. Yeah. We are about to end. So for the last question is, have you tried Starlink Internet? If so, what is your insights on it? I haven't tried it yet. I have friends that use it. Um, apart from the odd dropout, because obviously the satellites disappear yeah. and come back, um, the speed is good. The latency is almost as good as a mobile connection. Oh, really? Yeah. Um, so, from where I live in Brisbane down to Sydney is by fibre about 18 milliseconds latency. Mm -hmm. um, if you look at the same thing on Starlink, it's about 42 milliseconds. 42. So that's that's acceptable. Twi twice. But that's more than acceptable. Mm -hmm. um, Typical latency, so if you're thinking about a voice application, so if you're using um, WhatsApp or something, around 150 milliseconds is a usable service. Anything more than 150 milliseconds, you feel the latency and it's uh -huh. really hard to have a conversation. Uh -huh. So the fact that you can effectively have a conversation over a satellite without that weird delay, I think is a, a good achievement. The bandwidth is good. Um, we've just got to wait for the next generation of satellites that will allow satellite to satellite communication. Because at the moment, your little dishy antenna goes up, mm -hmm. comes down to a base station, goes to the content that you want, yeah. then back to the base station, up and down. Yeah. If both sides of that link are, are on the same satellite, uh -huh. then you don't have to go up and down as much. So, could it be possible that in Lambata to Sydney or Brisbane to connect within the under the 100 milliseconds using the Starlink? Probably not. Um, the way they've actually, at, well, unless they do something magical in the next generation of satellites, uh, probably not. Uh, you've still got a problem with the speed of light. It can only travel so fast. Um, from here to Sydney, for instance, is about uh, 10,000 kilometres and based on the speed of light, the best you could hope for is about 160 to 170 milliseconds round trip. Okay. Um, and we can nearly do that on fixed lines. So my workshops that I ran this week were all based in Brisbane, which means I have to land in Sydney first uh -huh. and then up to Brisbane. And we were getting about 230 milliseconds. So that's, I'm, I'm happy with that. Okay. And to achieve this, this thing, the only way is that fiber optics work. Correct. Glass uh, has, has the best connection, okay. without a doubt. So yeah, I think that's that. So the, thank you for accepting my invitation. No problem. Thanks for sharing the interesting and informations to about the internet and about your organization. So I very really appreciate that. No problem at all, Jay. Thanks for your time. Yeah, thank you. So see you next time. See yes. you next visit to Mongolia. Yeah. MN Nog Five. Yeah. <laughs>